The following podcast includes scary stories with content that could be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, you. Guess who's out of the void? <laughs> That's right. Yours truly, Terry C. Terry the C. Oh, you missed it. It was heroic. It was some Liam Neeson shit going on. It was some Pedro Pascal badassery. I feel like I now deserve some sort of Herculean nickname. Something hardcore. Something like The Rock or Rocky Balboa. No, Rocky, Rocky Soprano. Something that sounds cool and original and, and, and manly and... The mackerel? No. No. Malachi, I will not be referred to as the mackerel. (sighs) Though I hate to admit that name does accurately reflect the feat of strength itself. No. No, I will not be going into detail. I'm sure they don't have time for the full story anyway. They're not here for my bibbly babble. They're here for some cryptic stories. They can just use their imaginations to imagine my feat of bravery and strength. So, Enough, Malachi. Quiet. As you may remember, last time I saw you, you left me at the bottom of the void, covered in Crisco. Dick move, by the way. But I managed to get out, and you'll... Well, you'll just have to visualize my... greasy triumph. Oh, yeah, the void is still over there in the corner. Don't really know what I'm supposed to do about that. I... I put out a Craigslist ad in search of someone to fill my void, but it only yielded a bunch of very sad and somewhat provocative responses. And I did engage with a few of them, truth be told. Anyway, if you would like to fill my void, please write me at... Never mind, we'll get to that later. Anyway, all this to say, I'm out of the void. I am here, feeling better than ever, so you can tell the old lady next to you that she can stop crying. I'm totally... Totally okay. Oh no, not this again. Please tell me you brought your grandmother today and that she is an old Victorian woman with a lisp. Damn it, okay. So I might not have come out of the void totally unscathed. Um, I've been having a few minor instances of, well, shall we call it uh, enhanced ocular capacity? Okay, fine. I'm hallucinating, Malachi, a little. A little bit. A wee little bit. I think it's some sort of after effect from void travel, but at least, unlike you, I'm not wearing a parasitic octopus for a backpack. So who's the weird one now, huh, sucker? Oh, wait a minute. That's that's probably not happening either. Well, <clears throat> okay. Moving right along, I'm just going to play a tape now. Assuming this is a tape right here in my hand. I'm assuming that this is a television in front of me, and assuming that this hole here in my hand is entering into is the television's belly button. I'm... Ah! Oh! Oh! I don't like it. It's giving me a whole Videodrome vibe right now, and I love early Cronenberg, don't get me wrong, but this is... This is too much. Okay, first tape. This is in 1999, summertime. Living in a rural part of Michigan, a small town, about 2,000 people. Just finished my freshman year of college. It had been a very strange summer. There had been a murder of a young woman around my age. Not long after that, at the exit up from my exit, a very similar crime had happened. These two young women that had died in very similar circumstances. At both of these scenes of this crime, it was a red truck. I was dating my high school boyfriend. He worked second shift at General Motors. He would not get off work until 11 o'clock. 
I was still taking some classes during the day. And if we wanted to hang out, I would have to go over to his house after he got off work. So it'd be pretty late. In the past, I just would have driven over to my boyfriend's house. There was a lot more reluctance to kind of be out by myself at night. This was a Saturday night. He picked me up on the way home from work. We watched Saturday Night Live. It's about 1.45 or 2 in the morning. My boyfriend takes me back to my parents' house. My mom, at that time, was in Texas visiting her sister. So it was just my dad at home, and he had gone to bed hours before. I come into the house, lock the door behind me, and I saw his truck pull away. I had a little back powder room. Between the powder room and the laundry area is this door that is completely hidden, that faces out only into the woods. So there's no access point to it. There's no lighting for it. There's no way that you would ever see this door. It just is a door that we have that faces out into the woods. In all the years I lived in my parents' house, I've never walked in or out of this door. I'm brushing my teeth at the sink. And all of a sudden, at that back powder room door, in the pitch black with no light, I hear bang, bang, bang. I froze. I had come in the door 20 seconds beforehand, had seen nobody. I knew it was not my boyfriend. He had never used that door. He just would have come in with me. He would have come to the front door. He would have knocked on it. There's just no way that this is somebody that should be back here. I'm in the back of the house, by myself, in a room with the door closed. There's a window on that door. I'm not going to be able to walk out of here without passing by that window and seeing whatever's on the other side. I stood there, just frozen. Put the toothbrush down. I come out. There's nobody at the window. So I come around to the front of the house as fast as I can. There's all these windows along the hallway. I was just looking in each window. Who is this knocking? I'm coming down the hallway and I'm looking in the windows and just kind of in panic mode. I just got to get to the living room. I got to get to a phone or I got to get my dad or I got to do something. I come to the very front of the house where there's two big windows just looking at me in the window is a man. He started to tap one knuckle on the window. And he's saying, my truck broke down, can you let me in? My truck broke down, I need to use your phone. I again froze and stared at him and he stared back at me and he just kept tapping on the window. As I go to run to the front door, he smiles at me. I hid behind the front door. At the top of the door are three windows that go across. As I look up at these three little windows that are at the top of the door, I see two eyes come up looking into the house. I screamed. My dad comes to the top of the stairs. He's tired. He's disoriented. Dad, there's somebody at the door. There's somebody at the door. And my dad comes downstairs and he's like, what do you want? He starts talking to the person. What do you want? And he goes like he's going to open it. So I shove my dad back. My truck broke down. I just need to come inside. I just need to come inside and use your phone. And so I said, Dad, do not let him in here. 
I remember being anxious about going to the phone and leaving my dad on the steps because I thought if I walk away from my dad, he's going to open that door. So I convinced my dad to just don't do it. I made him come in the kitchen with me. I just knew that in this situation, if my dad opened that door, only bad things were going to happen. He's just going to come in and he's going to have a gun. And he's going to have the gun and he's going to have it out. And we're going to lose all of our power in this situation. We'll immediately be subject to whatever it is that he's wanting to do. I was panicky. I called my boyfriend and he was still awake. I need you to come over, but don't come over and don't get out of the car when you come over. And I said, his truck broke down, but I don't see a truck. I don't see anything. He was in the window, he was at the back door. And he was trying to calm me down. He was saying, what's going on? It took him a while for him to understand like what I could be talking about because he had just left. And, okay, calm down, calm down. I'm gonna get my dad up and we'll be over. It's only like a mile from my house to his house. But they drove up and down the streets and then finally my boyfriend came over with his dad and said, there's nobody out there. There's no truck, there's nothing broke down. There's nobody. There's no other way they could be down here. There was no other reason to be down here at the end of this street, unless they were waiting for me. I know that we never, my dad or I ever saw anybody turn their lights on and drive away. Life kind of resumes as normal. And then a couple years later, I get a call from my friend. There's a big commotion. There's a big arrest happening. We gotta see what it is. Go down there to see what's happening. There's all these cop cars, there's all this stuff happening. But you can't get anywhere close to it. That night on the news is a big deal. They have caught this killer named Jeffrey Wayne Gorton. He was living in my town and happened to live on a section of the same road where the young woman who had been murdered had been found. And the little section of the road that he lived on was directly between my boyfriend's house and my house. When I saw him on the screen, I thought, that's the guy that was at the window. That was him. He would murder women and decapitate them and then have souvenirs of them that he would keep. Different parts of their identification or some jewelry that they had, underwear that they were wearing. He had it in that house, the house right down the street. Part of my mind thinks, because this had been my boyfriend and I's routine for so long, I think he kind of knew that there was this young woman who is always over at that house and she's always over there really late. She leaves around this time, probably had followed us and knew where I was. You just don't know who might be living 10 doors down. We interrupt this broadcast for a very important announcement. It's ads time. Hit it! So, what did you think about that last story, hmm? <laughs> oh. Hmm. Wasn't it so... Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just distracted by all the whale song. Oh, how did I... When did I get so many whales? Have there always been so many whales in here? <laughs> what are whales doing in a video store anyway? And these, these are amazing whales. Are you not seeing these whales? Oh, this void side effect is better than any ayahuasca I've ever done. And a lot less cleanup. 
<laughs> you know what I mean. Hmm. No, no, Malachi, the whales are friendly. Well, hold on, let me check. Okay. No, the whales are mad. Oh, they're really pissed now, Malachi. Oh, I need to find some cure for this, some way out. I'm freaking out, man. I'm totally freaking out. Oh, shut up, Void. It's all your fault anyway, Voidy. Let's just play another tape while I try to find the antidote for this Void poisoning. Here we go. Play... I was living in this tiny town in Texas. It's called Georgetown. Around 10 or 11 at night, my uncle, he called my mom and he said, I was driving through the park. I found this girl and she's just sitting under a tree alone. And she's 16. She has a backpack and that's it. The allegation was that she had made a pass at her mom's boyfriend. Her mom kicked her out. We felt bad for her. My mom has always been a really like caring person. She just has a really big heart. So she was like, you know, we'll bring her here. She can sleep in Charity's room, my room at the time. We can help her find a place to stay. My mom was like, it's a school night, you should be in bed. No, like, I want to wait till she gets here, I want to meet her. I kind of talked my mom into letting me stay up. She came in through the door. She kind of had her head down a little bit. She just looked very sad. She had on all black. A black hoodie, black skinny jeans. Just really quiet, shy. And then my uncle was like, this is Laura. We shook her hand. She was really respectful. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. She took a seat on the couch. I've always wanted a sister. She said, we could be like sisters. I was really happy about that. My mom told her, we're gonna help you. I wanna try and help you find family, somewhere to stay. The next morning, everything was fine. We had breakfast. My mom let her use the phone to try to call her mom, see if there was anybody that she could stay with. Nobody answered. I felt really bad. I know she was sad over that and upset. She kind of told us a little bit of the story of why she got kicked out. I didn't come on to my mom's boyfriend. He had been coming on to me. She was on the couch. I had this little pull-out chair. I always like to watch my little shows in my chair. I could feel eyes looking at me from behind. At first I thought, it's probably nothing, and I just kept watching my show. I turn around and she's giving me a look that could kill. I turned around and I kept watching my show. I could still feel her eyes on me. At this point I was like, okay, just ignore it. It's probably nothing. Maybe you thought she was looking at you mean. She really wasn't. I turn around again and she's still giving me a hatred look. It was just this very harsh glare. I could still feel her staring at me was starting to freak me out. I just got up and I left the TV on. I went to my mom's room. A couple days later, we're having dinner. It's a normal night. 
I went to go to the sink to wash my plate. I hear her just let out this exorcist scream. I was freaked out. She's bent back over the dining room chair. She's stretched out and her hands are like claws. She's just screaming. What is going on? Throws herself on the floor and she just starts crawling like the grudge, screaming and growling. That would switch to these screeches. All while growling on the floor, muttering things about the devil. I grew up very religious, so my mom immediately grabs the Bible and starts praying for her. My mom was under the impression that she was possessed. My uncle had holy oil and was anointing her and trying to pray over her. Laura froze, then just looked at her and kept screaming again. They were rebuking the devil, praying for God to heal her. God help her, God help her. They were reading Bible scriptures. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that will fear no evil. I had a friend over. We ran to my mom's room and connecting to my mom's room, it was a bathroom. We were in there and we locked the door. It was getting late and my friend was like, I gotta go home, you know, I, I'm sorry, you know, I gotta go. So her mom picked her up and she went out the back door. I'm in the bathroom, I'm listening to these screams and you know, my mom trying to pray for her. It felt like it went on for hours. It sounded like if you had audio on from the exorcist playing in the other room. Finally, after it got quiet, she was like, I've been freed from this demon. I had poked my head out the door. She's curled up on the couch with a blanket without a care in the world, like it never happened. She's smiling and she looks super happy. Very, very eerie to just see her like that. Her eyes shoot open and she sees me and we make eye contact. She gave me another pretty serious death glare. I put a chair up against my door that night. The next morning, I really just tried to be as standoffish as I could. I didn't really even want to look in the same direction as her. I didn't want to make eye contact with her. I was pretty scared of her. If I went to the kitchen to get breakfast, I kept my head down. I was really freaked out. The second night after this happened, I was already asleep, but my mom, she had this feeling in her gut to go to the bedroom door, go to the hallway and open the door. She opened it and she saw Laura crawling towards my mom's bedroom. She grabbed her hands and she said, we're gonna go to bed now, okay? Laura looked past her shoulder at me while I was sleeping and glared at me. That's when my mom said she knew that this was very bad. This girl did not have good intent towards me. 
She took her in my bedroom and Laura didn't come out of the room after that. My mom had actually stayed up half of the night and she was talking with my uncle. This girl doesn't have good intentions. This isn't safe, this isn't good. It was almost like Laura was jealous of me that I had a family. This girl needs help. She needs actual help. The next morning, I woke up and my mom said that we we're gonna go out to eat at my favorite restaurant. Is Laura going? Your uncle's gonna take Laura somewhere. I'm getting in the car and I look over and I see Laura getting into my uncle's truck. She had her arms folded over her chest and she had this very like pouty look. She looked over at me, we made eye contact and I got another death glare. I watched as they drove away. I've never seen her again. I've never heard anything of her again. But I hope she got the help she needed. <laughs> now time for some ads. Okay, welcome back. Hello. I think I'm getting a little better. I guess you can always count on the tincture of time. The old Victorian woman left on the steamboat a few minutes ago. The angry whales have shrunken down to mere irritable minnows. I think this strange trip will be done in a couple of hours, and oh, what a relief that will be. <clears throat> I'll see you next time, my friend, for our regularly scheduled programming. And don't forget to say goodbye to Elvis on your way out. He's signing autographs over there right next to Timothy Chalamet in a dress. Hello, fellas. Such nice people. Radio Rental is created by Payne Lindsay and brought to you by Tenderfoot TV. Lead producer is Eric Quintana. Executive producers are Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. Hosted by Rain Wilson as his character, Terry Carnation. Written and produced by Meredith Stedman. Supervising producer is Tracy Kaplan. Associate producer is Jaja Muhammad. Editing by Eric Quintana, Mike Rooney, Sean Nerney, and Sydney Evans. Additional writing by Mark Lachlan. Sound design, mix, and master by Cooper Skinner. Additional sound design and mixing by Devin Johnson. Original score by Makeup and Vanity Set. Video editing by Dylan Harrington. Cover artwork by Trevor Eiler and Rob Sheridan. Special thanks to Oren Rosenbaum and the team at UTA, the Nord Group, Station 16, Beck Media and Marketing, and the team at Cadence 13. If you have a radio rental story that you'd like to share, please email us at yourscarystory at gmail.com or contact us via the form on our website, radiorentalusa.com. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Rental. You can also follow the illustrious Terry Carnation on social media. Just search at Terry Carnation. On behalf of the Radio Rental store, we'd love it if you'd subscribe, rate, and review. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.